the headmistress of a prestigious girls' school shot and killed her lover, the Scarsdale diet doctor. She called it a suicide attempt gone wrong. I shouldn't have taken a, a gun to High's house. I should have stayed in Madeira and shot myself there, but I didn't do it, so. She thought that this whole criminal justice thing that was going on was an inconvenience. She very, very much resisted taking advice from anyone. It would have been better if she kept her mouth shut and looked more demure and more wilting. Which is why I became, you know, the arrogant old bitch in that trial. Harris insisted the shooting was an awful mistake. A jury would decide it was murder. It was March 10th, 1980, when Jean Harris broke down. As headmistress of the prestigious Madera School for Girls in McLean, Virginia, she'd gone on an extensive fundraising tour for the school. It had left her exhausted. She'd expelled four seniors after finding marijuana paraphernalia in their dorm rooms, and she believed the school's board of directors never supported her in her work. Her personal life seemed worst of all. Two days earlier, she had run out of desoxin, a dangerous form of speed she'd been taking for nearly 10 years. It had been prescribed by her lover of 14 years, Dr. Herman Tarnauer. The world knew him as the author of the popular Scarsdale Diet. Jean called him by his nickname, Hi. Jean also knew he was seeing a younger woman. That afternoon, she finished writing Tarnauer a letter bitterly criticizing the other woman. She then prepared a series of suicide notes. But I did that day just think I've had enough. I, I, can't, I can't put up with anything anymore. I can't put up with me anymore. <clears throat> so I quickly wrote my will again and made sure that it was notarized by the woman in the office and wrote a on a pathetic note to the board and got in the car and went to High's house. The note to the school's board said, quote, I was a person and no one ever knew. In another note intended for whomever found her body, she said, quote, I wish to be cremated as cheaply as possible and immediately thrown away. She made one last call to Tarnauer. I'd been calling him all week to try and get him to send me my prescription. He'd just casually forgotten after nine and a half years of feeding me speed, I didn't have any. And uh, I said, hi, I'm coming up to get it. And he said, suit yourself. Sounds just like him, suit yourself. As a spring thunderstorm brewed, Jean drove off into the Virginia evening, headed for Tarnower's estate in Westchester County, New York. In her purse, she had a 32 caliber pistol loaded with five bullets in the six bullet cylinder. In her pocket were some extra bullets. Jean arrived at the estate at 10.30 p.m. No lights had been left on for her. She found the familiar entrance through the garage door and made her way into Tarnauer's bedroom, calling his name. She would later testify that he answered her request for a tender farewell, saying, shut up and go to bed. When I wouldn't talk, I didn't know what to do. Jean went into what had always been her bathroom. She found another woman's nightgown, curlers and perfumes. Yelling with rage, she threw them, breaking a window. I got out of his bed and hit her twice across the face. She recalls she sat on the other bed, which had always been hers. Told him to hit her again and said, make it hard enough to kill. I walked away, telling Jean she was crazy. Jean recalls that she then took the gun from her purse and put it to her temple, that High reached from behind her to get the pistol away, and that the bullet exploded from the barrel. I said I shot him in the hand, but it, when he grabbed it was when the gun went off and it went right through his hand. Bleeding from his hand, High picked up a telephone to call the couple who lived downstairs and worked for him as estate manager and housekeeper, Henry and Suzanne Vandervrecken. Their phone was busy. I had put the revolver next to him on the bed. Jean recalls that she grabbed it and again raised it to her head and that High leaned forward and began a tug of war over the gun. She squeezed off two more shots into High's shoulder. The second of these shots broke High's collarbone and tore open the artery beneath it. 
he fell forward onto Jean, still struggling for the gun, unaware he was bleeding to death. High put his hands on Jean's side and pressed his thumb into her abdomen. She would later recall she thought his thumb was really the gun barrel, and wanting to shoot herself, she fired again, shattering High's upper arm. As High fell back on the bed, Jean says she again put the revolver to her head and pulled the trigger. It was the only empty chamber in the gun. Looking at the gun, she pulled the trigger yet again and discharged the last live round harmlessly into a cabinet next to the bed. But Jean didn't know that was the last live round. She put the gun back to her head and pulled the trigger four more times. Harris tried to reload, but had no idea how to get the spent bullets out of the cylinder. She banged the pistol on the bathtub and broke it. Showing it to Tarnauer, she said, I think it's dead. She remembers he answered, you are probably right. His last words to her. Thinking High's telephone was out of order, Jean ran from the house to drive to a payphone. When a police car appeared, she turned around and led police back to the house. She was greeted by Henry van der Vrecken, yelling, she did it, she's the one. The story that Jean Harris and her defense team would present in court portrayed the death of the Scarsdale diet doctor as a tragic accident. Experts hired by Mrs. Harris said the evidence supported her version of events. As they reconstructed the shooting, Harris fired the gun four times while trying to kill herself and instead shot and killed the man she loved. The prosecution would counter that no one is accidentally shot four times. They said Harris was a woman scorned and enraged who walked into her lover's bedroom and murdered him. But American justice is full of surprises. And in this case, the surprise was that Mrs. Harris herself through her behavior in the courtroom would determine the outcome of the case. In the early morning hours of March 11th, 1980, Harrison New York police arrested Jean Harris and charged her with aggravated assault. A few moments later, the hospital called. Herman Tarnauer was dead. Jean collapsed, sobbing into a friend's arms. The charges were upgraded to second degree murder. Her family and friends arranged for attorney Joel Arno to take her case. He saw her for the first time in jail. She was so distraught that they had her under a suicide watch at the jail where their physicians had seen her. And as a condition of getting her out on a reasonable $50,000 bail, which actually was a low bail, uh, we were going to put her in a psychiatric hospital until the doctor there determined that she was well enough with the court's permission to be out of the hospital. When Jean was admitted to the hospital, her psychiatrist tried to treat her depression with medications. She refused to take anything but desoxin. The only uh, medication she would take uh, would be what uh, Dr. Tarnauer had prescribed. The story hit the front page of the next morning's newspapers. They told of a standard love triangle. The 58-year-old headmistress, the 71-year-old diet doctor, and his 38-year-old assistant. But the story of Jean Harris and Herman Tarnauer's lives and the tragedy they came to was much deeper and darker. Jean Struven Harris was a child of privilege, born into an upper middle class family in suburban Cleveland. She attended a private girls school and spent summers with her family in southern Ontario. She graduated from Smith College magna cum laude, and Phi Beta Kappa. Then Jean did exactly what many young women of her generation did. In 1946, she married a man just home from the war. They moved to his hometown of Gross Point, Michigan, but she couldn't sit at home all day. She began teaching in a local grade school. The main reason I became a teacher was because the closest thing to the place where I could get a job was a school. Her career was briefly interrupted when her two sons were born. She eventually returned to her teaching, but there was nothing left for Jean in her marriage. After 19 years, she divorced her husband. She was 42 years old. In 
It was 1966, and at a dinner party in New York City, Jean Harris met Dr. Herman Tarnauer, a cardiologist with a successful practice among the wealthy families of New York's Westchester County. She joined his social circle at dinners and on vacations. I gave her flowers, took her dancing, and only two months after they'd met, he proposed marriage with a four-carat diamond ring. She said yes. But after a 14-month engagement, he told her he couldn't go through with it. I was 58 years old and had never married. It wasn't in him to be a loving person. He, he was too driven to be somebody that he wasn't born to be. Herman Tarnauer was born in the Flatbush section of Brooklyn, one of four children and the only son of immigrant Russian Jews. Brought up in poverty, Hai wanted a better life for himself. He went to medical school, then moved to Westchester to set up his clinic among Scarsdale's sweeping estates. I mean, this guy wanted to, to be somebody. He wanted money, he wanted to know people who had money, and he wanted to be good at his job. Following a stint in the Army during World War II, Dr. Tarnauer returned to Scarsdale, where his patients included some of New York's wealthiest Jewish families. He joined the Century Club to play golf and socialize with them. They took him on trips around the world and he entertained them at dinner parties in his home. He wanted to be part of the crowd. But he said to me one day, did you ever notice I'm always asking people what they think, but they never ask me what I think. Tells you, you know, that's the little boy from Brooklyn still. He was, he was aspiring to a group of people who didn't give a bloody darn what he thought. When the engagement was broken, Jean wrote High a letter, telling him that marriage didn't matter so long as they could be together. Jean accepted a new role, not as a wife, but as High's dinner party hostess, intellectual partner, and traveling companion to exotic locales. He showed me much of the world, but before we went, he was almost like my father in a way. We read lots of books about where we were going. I mean, you didn't just go and taste the cuisine. You, you really got into a, what, what the history of it was and what it was about. The trips were often bittersweet for Jean because she never had High's undivided attention. I knew that he had a little girl who sent him birthday cards and cute little things everywhere we went all around the world and started in 1974. Matter of fact, it seemed to me it started sooner than that. Wherever we went, we'd check at the hotel for mail and there was always a cute little card from Lynn. <laughs> Lynn Triforos worked as an assistant in Dr. Tarnauer's office. As much as Jean tried to ignore her presence in High's life, the relationship was affecting Jean very deeply. On one instance, she came back from a trip around the world with him, only to find Lynn Triforos in the driveway with a suitcase, ready to leave for Mexico with the doctor. Hi, Tarnauer's friends, his family, and his housekeeper, Suzanne Vandervrecken, all knew that he was bringing other women home to his bed. Jean chose to ignore Lynn Triforos and the rest of them. Suzanne had said to me, I hope you don't think that you're the only woman in his life. And I said, well, I don't know whether I am, but I know he's the only man in mine. And she said, oh, madame, you have put him on a pedestal. He's just an ordinary man. It was in 1970 that Dr. Tarnauer first prescribed disoxin for Jean. She told him she was always feeling tired and unable to do her work. Disoxin, a form of speed, gave her the energy she needed. What neither of them knew was Jean suffered from clinical depression, an illness aggravated by the drug. Desoxin hits the central nervous system like cocaine. Its effects include insomnia and loss of appetite. Users feel strong and independent. They often work compulsively. It's forbidden for long-term use and is listed as a dangerous drug. From the time she started to use it, Jean was taking an average to high average dose of desoxin every day. She would take it for the next nine and a half years. It's classified as a dangerous drug because it's so easily abused and individuals um, uh, 
take it in increasing dosages and it can cause in itself, in higher doses, it can cause a psychotic picture very much like paranoid schizophrenia, as a matter of fact. But if Dr. Tarnauer said the drug was all right, Jean wasn't going to doubt him. She needed it to keep working. In 1977, Mrs. Harris moved to Virginia. She had been named headmistress of the Madera School for Girls, one of the country's best-known private secondary schools. The move took her away from High Tarnower and his New York estate, which had been her weekend home for years. When I was leaving for Virginia, I said, I've, I've thought of buying a house somewhere here. And he said, why would you buy a house here? You have a home. This is your home. Jean's work at Madera was a demanding schedule of meetings, teaching, and entertaining. Former faculty members recall that they liked working with Mrs. Harris, but none of them was her friend. Jean felt the board hated her, so each weekend she'd make every effort to visit High in New York. In 1978, the Scarsdale Diet was born. For years, Dr. Tarnauer had been giving his patients copies of a low-cholesterol, low-fat diet that he had simply typed up at his clinic. High's friends in the publishing business convinced him to turn it into a book, but Dr. Tarnauer didn't like the way the first draft was written. He brought the manuscript to Jean to polish it up. I sat on the floor of his living room for two weeks and just tried to rewrite parts of that book just to take out some of the garbage. Dr. Tarnauer's complete Scarsdale medical diet was an instant bestseller. For her work on it, Dr. Tarnauer made his first dedication in the book to Jean. The book made so much money, he was afraid his partners and others would want part of the profits. Without any discussion, High handed Jean a $2,000 check for her work on it. The payment insulted Jean. She had done the work because she loved him, even as High was taking Lynn to dinner parties while Jean was toiling away on his book. But the final outrage was an upcoming 1980 Man of the Year dinner honoring Dr. Tarnauer. He informed Jean he would be taking Lynn. His decision enraged Jean, but she felt reassured. After High proposed that both women could attend the dinner at separate tables, he would sit alone on the dais. But in late February 1980, Jean, still furious, was losing control and running low on her supply of disoxin. She mentioned it to Madera's school doctor. And I said to the doctor, would you prescribe some disoxin for me while you're here? And he said, disoxin? That's a mind-altering drug. I wouldn't give you that. And after he left, I went right to the phone and called Hi. And I said, Hi, the doctor here says I shouldn't take that. And Hi said, well, he's crazy as hell. The little bit you take doesn't do any harm at all. On Thursday, March 6th, Jean ran out of disoxin. She slipped into acute withdrawal from the drug, becoming paranoid and suicidal. In her anxiety and despair, Jean started a letter to High that she would write over the next three days. It was by turns bitter and pleading, affectionate and pathetic. She closed it by saying she looked forward to seeing High at the dinner. Jean mailed it to High's house. Had both of us lived, I would have uh, just called him and said, throw it out without reading it, but I... Sunday was a pretty bad day. It was that Monday, after repeated calls to Tarnauer, that she gave up and drove to New York with her 32 caliber revolver. Jean Harris held firmly to the statement that she had not murdered Herman Tarnauer, that it was she who wanted to die. She believed that was all she'd have to tell the jury. Mrs. Harris was about to learn that the real world of American justice played by a tougher set of rules than she had taught in her high school civics classes. When Jean Harris was charged with second-degree murder and the death of Dr. Herman Tarnauer, she entered a plea of not guilty. She was soon released from a psychiatric hospital and began staying in a private home in Scarsdale. As a condition of her bail, she could not leave Westchester County as she prepared for her trial. She um, 
was very depressed most of the time and uh, her sessions with her lawyer generally left her even more depressed. At times she was uh, quite overtly suicidal. It was ups and it was downs and it was despair and it was anger and rage and it was hopelessness and then it was determination and it was just like a chameleon. It changed colors all the time. Prosecutors believed it was an easy case. They had the pistol Jean had given them. She admitted the gun was hers. She told police she remembered holding the weapon and shooting high in the hand. And in police presence, she told an attorney friend on the telephone, quote, I think I've killed high. It wasn't a whodunit in this case. It was really, why did she do it? Did she intend to murder Dr. Tarnauer, or was there some other alternative scenario that was going on? The one piece of evidence that we didn't have um, that was sort of kept in suspense until the end was the, the infamous or famous Scarsdale letter. Jean's bitter letter to High, written the weekend before the shooting, became the object of a race between defense and prosecuting attorneys. Prosecutors got a state warrant for the letter, but the warrant was refused because anything in the hands of the U.S. Post Office is federal property. I was familiar with some postal regulations, and I knew that if we had a form signed by Jean, the post office would return the mail to the sender on request. So I asked my partner, John Kellegrew, to take that form back to the jail where they were keeping Jean and to have her sign it. He notarized it and brought it over to the postmaster. The defense team won the race to get the letter. They quickly realized it could both help them and hurt them. It showed Jean's love for High Tarnauer, her rage with Lynn Triforis, and her pain over being scorned by her lover. Jean starts the letter still angry with High about the Man of the Year dinner. She writes that she would only be there because a friend had invited her. Then she attacks Lynn Triforis. Jean writes that she told her friend, quote, I would be there even if that slut comes. Indeed, I don't care if she pops naked out of a cake with her tits frosted with chocolate. All I ever asked for was to be with you, and when I left, to know when we would see each other again so there was something in life to look forward to. Now you are taking that away from me too, and I am unable to cope. Stupid is certainly not the word for Lynn. In that I was totally wrong. Dishonest, ignorant, and tasteless, but God knows, not stupid. You have been what you carefully set out to be, High. The most important thing in my life. The most important human being in my life, and that will never change. Jean did not want Westchester County lead prosecutor George Bolin to see the letter. It was a terrible letter, but, uh, and Joel said to me, Jean, I will go to prison before this is ever seen by anyone. I will never, ever show it to anyone. I had explained to Jean, but particularly, that George would never get to see the Scarsdale letter if she didn't testify. The defense team focused on the evidence police had gathered. They had photographed bloodstains, bullet holes, and broken windows. The phone that Tarnauer tried to use to call for help was covered with his blood. But the crime scene had been contaminated. The police chief and the chief of detectives used the phone to make outside calls. Investigators had moved evidence around the room. Before they left the scene, police had rolled up the blankets in bed sheets and put them in a bag. The bloodstains had leaked through the linens, rendering the evidence useless. Both sides in the case wanted to hire the same forensic scientist. Herbert McDonnell had testified in many trials about bloodstains. He was also an expert on bullet trajectories. Defense attorney Joel Arno got to him first. When I retained him, I wanted to tell him exactly what I thought had happened. He said, oh, please don't do that. I will visit the crime scene and then I'll tell you what happened. McDonnell studied evidence and photographs given to him by the police but they told only part of the story. In late September 1980, McDonald took Jean back to the Tarnauer estate. 
He wanted to see where she fit into his conclusions on bullet patterns. With her help, MacDonald constructed the shot sequence, that is, where Jean Harris and High Tarnauer were when each of the five bullets was fired. Bullet number one. Jean puts the gun to her head. High grabs the gun and is shot in the hand. Bullets two and three. In a tug of war over the gun, Jean shoots High twice in the shoulder, fatally wounding him. If I were to use this as trajectory, one of those two shots struck just above the clavicle with a trajectory something like this. The other one struck over the shoulder with a similar trajectory. They were parallel. Bullet number four. High grabs Jean by the waist. Thinking his thumb is the gun, she fires to kill herself and shoots him in the arm. High falls back. Jean raises the gun to her head and hits the chamber with no bullet in it. Lowering the gun, she pulls the trigger to test it. Bullet number five slams into the cabinet. Again, she puts the gun to her head and pulls the trigger. She went click, 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 click. Every time she told the story, she did it four times. I listened very carefully. And if you examine the cartridges, as I have later, you'll find that four out of five have been struck twice with the hammer, the firing pin, actually. McDonald also traced blood patterns on the bedroom carpet. He could see where High had walked around the bedroom, blood gushing from his hand. And police evidence technicians found that High's blood had seeped into the gun barrel when he had held it in his wounded hand. Jean told McDonald she went into the bathroom to reload the gun with bullets from her pocket, but she didn't know how to get the spent cartridges out of the cylinder. She did not understand that the ejector rod is part of the uh, cylinder release, and you push it, the cartridges come out. So she banged it on the side of the tub, and when she did, the blood came out, and those spots are in the police photographs and are identified as blood. Prosecutors prepared a different scenario. They believed Jean had walked into the bedroom with her gun drawn. Tarnauer was shot in the hand, they would say, when he raised it to defend himself, because Jean was aiming to shoot him in the chest. They needed to prove her intent was to murder him. Jean Harris had no idea what she would face in the courtroom. Her attorney was discovering he had a difficult client who wouldn't listen to him. This is an extraordinarily bright woman. Also a very articulate one. Unfortunately, under very severe psychological stress throughout the period, absolutely accustomed to making her own way in the world and relying only on her decisions, and she very, very much resisted taking advice from anyone Although the defense attorney didn't have his client's cooperation, he did have the physical evidence from the scene that he believed would support Jean's version of the shooting, and he had the expert testimony of Herb McDonnell. It seems impossible to think that someone could accidentally shoot someone four times, but that is what happened in this case. No matter what physical evidence existed to support her story, Jean Harris was adamant that she be allowed to take the stand, a dangerous move for any defendant, especially at a murder trial. But no one, not her attorney, not her friends, not her family, not even the judge, could persuade the headmistress that she was wrong. Jean Harris came to court charged with murder in the second degree. She had helped her lawyer prepare the case, but she was ignoring his advice. She rejected any sort of insanity plea, and she insisted, over his strenuous objections, that she would testify and tell her story. Presiding over the case was Judge Russell Leggett. When the case came in, it was purely uh, a murder case. I gathered there were four or five shots fired into the um, late Dr. Tarnauer's upper torso, and uh, to me it was appeared that she obviously went in to get the job done and did it. Every day, Jean arrived wearing what she called her work clothes, tweed suits with silk scarves, pearl necklaces, fine sweaters. To the jury, she looked rich and seemed arrogant. She came in dressed up like Astor's pet horse, dolled up to beat the band, looked like a million bucks, and a person who should never do a thing like this to the jury. I always got the impression um, 
during the course of our case that she thought that what was going on, this whole criminal justice thing that was going on, was an inconvenience. As lead prosecutor George Bolin presented the state's case, Jean sneered at witnesses or angrily disagreed with them in a voice loud enough to be heard, but not loud enough for her to be held in contempt. If I think something's right or wrong, I don't sit in the corner and, and pretend it isn't so, which is why I became, you know, the arrogant old bitch in that trial. It would have been better if she kept her mouth shut and looked more demure and more wilting as opposed to being uh, intellectually aggressive on everything that was happening. It was the testimony of housekeeper Suzanne Vanderbrecken that truly shocked Jean. Suzanne and her husband Henry had worked at the Tarnauer estate for 16 years. Suzanne took the stand to read from a black book she had kept. In it, she had recorded the names of women who had been High's overnight guests. Jean was humiliated. And then she took an oath on the Bible and said to a jury, Mrs. Harris threatened to uh, sue the doctor and destroy his life. No, how do you prove a negative? You say, I didn't say that. Never would have. Never entered my head. Jean never expected that witnesses would see the events leading up to High's shooting in a different way than she saw them. Her judgment and behavior in court were heavily influenced by desoxin. She was still taking the drug and would take it throughout her trial. Jean relaxed when the defense began telling her story. Herb McDonald took the stand and told the courtroom his theory about the sequence of gunshots. Prosecutor Bolin taunted the forensic scientist, asking if he wanted to examine the sheets from Dr. Tarnauer's bed. McDonald surprised the courtroom when he said, yes. He draped them over the jury box and read the bloody linens like a road map of the struggle between High and Jean. He certainly put together an alternative scenario, but I don't, it just didn't buy it at all. And even trying to be very objective about it, didn't buy it. And he did come across as being, you know, a Mr. Know-it-all. McDonnell also testified that Prosecutor Bolin had originally called him to try to hire him for the case. Bolin jumped up and said, I don't remember that. And I reached in my pocket and I said, well, I have a cassette tape recording of our conversation as well as if you prefer and I reached in and I said here's a transcript of it that clearly shows what you said and what I said and he sat down very quickly. The wound to Dr. Tarnauer's chest became the most controversial part of the trial. The state's pathologist testified that there was hand tissue in the chest because the bullet had gone through Dr. Tarnauer's hand as he tried to defend himself. The bullet then went into his chest a defense expert countered that there was no hand tissue in the chest. He said there are three fragments. One is burned so badly it's beyond recognition, no human could tell you what it was. The other two are cartilage. I thought, this is wonderful, he's going to tell them what it really is. And then I looked over at the jury and sometimes during his testimony three people were asleep, sound asleep. It was the most important testimony in the trial and it bored them to death. Jean was so angry with the jury, the witnesses, and the prosecutors, she could not resist talking to the media about it. Her attorney tried to stop her. And I would always leave an associate out to keep an eye on her, because she had orders not to talk to the press. And I'd come out and she'd be holding a press conference. She was busy telling them all her fancied injustices. And she would do it no matter what anybody else told her. Believing the physical evidence favored the defense, Joel Arno wanted to rest his case after the forensic testimony. Gene Harris would not let him do that. I had a client who wanted to testify. I wasn't easy for Joel. I know that I wasn't. I became consumed by that trial and uh, making lists of who said what and why it wasn't true and all that. And uh, I thought I was being a good defendant when I took the stand. And eight full days on that stand and uh, I was terrible. During her trial preparation Jean had always shown remorse weeping for high Tarnauer every time she sat in her lawyer's office. 
but the heartbroken woman Joel Arno had seen in his office turned into the haughty headmistress on the stand. She was frozen in stone. And when I tried to blast her free, to reach the buried emotion, to make her cry, George Bowen sat there silently. The judge watched it keenly. He knew what was going on. And Jean, figuring out that I was trying to get her to cry, came back with that devastating, please, Joel, don't do that. It was um, almost as if she were describing a trip to the supermarket. It was not an emotional description. It was very, very third person. It wasn't something she was describing that she had experienced, but she was telling us about this event that wasn't really something she was involved in. When prosecutor George Boland stood up to cross-examine her, Jean vented her rage. Boland said to me, what was the position of the drawer before you opened it? When you walked into the room that night, was the light switch on, in the on or off position? Now, you know, when you get enough of those, you think, what's going on? Someone's just playing games with me. This can't be serious. Bolin took advantage of Jean's anger. It was exactly what he wanted the jury to see. There's nothing wrong with that, because you've got to convince the jury that this person had that kind of temper to commit the crime. Otherwise, they're never going to convict that person. Just as Joel Arno had warned her, the prosecutor began asking Jean about this Scarsdale letter. It was the letter she'd written over her last weekend at Madeira, the weekend she'd given up hope. I Tarnauer hadn't lived to see it. Judge Leggett let the prosecutor read it aloud in court. It would have been wrong for me to keep it out. It would have been cutting the heart to a degree out of the people's case in this murder trial because it expressed her very thoughts on the day that she went up there. The defense team hoped that the jury would be impressed by Jean's expression of love for High, but instead they were stunned by Jean's rage in the Scarsdale letter, the coarse language she used to talk about Lynn Triforis, and her pathetic pleading to remain in High's life. No one would believe that Jean was a lady after they heard the Scarsdale letter and whatnot with the obscenities in it. Jean's anger, her coldness, her tirades in the courtroom, even the Scarsdale letter, might have been explained in court through psychiatric testimony. Jean would not allow it. There had been so many lies told under oath in that courtroom. I was afraid of who they would bring in as another psychiatrist, and I just didn't want to go through that. It was her worst mistake. New York courts allow a plea of extreme emotional disturbance, or EED. It's a plea for mercy, so juries can see that defendants are under such stress. They no longer control their actions. Arno had prepared defense psychiatrists to give such testimony on Jean's behalf. However, a plea of EED would mean prosecution psychiatrists would be allowed to interview Jean and give their opinions on her mental health a strategic dilemma for the defense. The judge met with Jean and her attorney. He said, I, if I bring in a treating psychiatrist, the DA wants to get hold of a psychiatrist to cross-examine him to get extreme emotional disturbance into the case. Mrs. Harris grabbed him by the arm and she said, my God, Joel, no, no, we don't want the psychiatric defense. Judge Leggett ruled that Harris had the right to make her own decision on her plea. Jean rejected EED and the defense rested. In his summation, Arno told the jurors, don't compromise. He believed the jury would conclude that a lady as intelligent and refined as Jean Harris could not commit a murder. The jury deliberated for eight days. Ultimately, Jean's rejection of the plea of emotional distress left them with no flexibility. The jury came back with a guilty verdict. Joel Arno was in tears. Jean Harris didn't react. It's just the end of the world, and, then, and then what are you going to do? Harris was immediately taken away to the Westchester County Jail. She would spend the next three and a half weeks there waiting for sentencing. 
Having been found guilty of second-degree murder, Jean Harris would use her final day in court, her sentencing, to let everyone, prosecutor, jury, and judge, know what she thought of them. Jean Harris had battled vigorously through her 14-week trial right up to the guilty verdict. The Jean Harris who came into Judge Leggett's courtroom to be sentenced in March 1981 seemed utterly drained. She was just exhausted, and she looked exhausted, and she looked beaten, and she looked pathetic. And she came over that way, and I said to myself, if she had been this way during the trial, they would not have gotten a conviction. When Judge Leggett told her she could make a statement, Jean got back on her high horse and angrily rejected their decision. She told the court it was a travesty that Prosecutor George Bolin and Judge Leggett could put her in a cage for the rest of her life. She attacked the jury for taking advantage of the fame that the trial brought them. Finally, she lashed out at Bolin. He had said Harris showed no remorse about Dr. Tarnower's death. Jean told the court, no one in the world feels that loss more than I do. I am not guilty. She wanted to ignore what the truth was. She wanted to believe in an alternative scenario, that she loved, you know, High Tarnower more than she loved anyone else in the world, and that this was terrible what happened, and it was a terrible tragedy. And she really wanted to believe that. And she went with that. And um, I guess I've always felt it's unfortunate that somebody could be convicted of murder in the second degree, go to jail for 15 years, because they didn't have a firm grip on reality. Judge Leggett gave her the minimum sentence, 15 years to life. An hour after sentencing, Jean entered the Bedford Hills Maximum Security Prison. Within the prison walls, she soon found a new project to which she could dedicate herself, the children of her fellow inmates. She spent her time in the prison nursery, teaching parenting skills. She wrote three books during her time in Bedford Hills, all bestsellers. The first book was about her relationship with Dr. Tarnower, and what she referred to only as the night high died. Proceeds from that book went to an endowment fund she had started to educate the inmates' children. After nearly 12 years in prison, Jean's health was failing. At 69 years old, she'd had two heart attacks. In December 1992, Harris was in Westchester County Medical Center Hospital, preparing for open heart surgery. Appeals of her case had all failed. Her son Jim had organized petition drives to urge New York Governor Mario Cuomo to grant Jean clemency. Three times, Governor Cuomo had rejected those pleas. A telephone call came to the hospital. I picked up the phone and this man said, Mrs. Harris, this is Dr. Harvan. We've been on the phone nine times to Albany today, and the uh, governor asked me to tell you he has decided to give you clemency, and he said to be sure and tell you before you go into the operation. <laughs> so that was how I learned that I had clemency. I saw, I spoke with Governor Cuomo at another dinner party and thanked him for giving me clemency. And he said, very quickly, I didn't give you anything. You earned it. There are people in prison today because they abused their children. In 1993, uh, right after her release from prison, Jean spoke to a congressional committee themselves. about women inmates. She lectured around the country about inmates and their children, all the time collecting donations. She saw her Children of Bedford Fund help two daughters of inmates get their master's degrees. In the course of her new life, Jean finally accepted that she was responsible for High Tarnower's death. But it was not murder. I shouldn't have taken a, a gun to High's house. I should have stayed in Madeira and shot myself there, but I didn't do it. So certainly I was guilty of that. But to think that I, I would walk up into his room and stand over a person to sleep and, and, uh, and shoot him. It just didn't happen. Jean Harris bitterly acknowledged that she would be known as a murderer for the rest of her life. But she bears responsibility for the jury's decision. Against her lawyer's advice, she took the stand. The jurors did not like the woman they saw and heard. They might have understood if psychiatric testimony had been given to explain her behavior, but Harris wouldn't allow it. 
Harris insisted that she was the only one who really knew what happened that night. The expert testimony lent credibility to her account. But in the end, her trial stands out as a remarkable example of a defendant who acted as if the justice system should play by her rules. A mistake for which she paid dearly.